I love to dig into the work and the projects and the case studies and that kind of stuff. And we've got a really cool one in this America 250 project. But but before we get too close to it, um, I'm a bicentennial baby. So this America 250 thing is uh, unfortunately pointing out a big birthday that I have coming up in six years. So <laughs> if we could just not mention that anymore in the interview, that would be great. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, we've got a two-for-one sale. I'm chatting with Valerie Aurelio, General Manager at Landor & Fitch, and Phyllis Murphy, Executive Creative Director at Landor & Fitch. If you're doing any design work in the branding space, there's very little chance you haven't heard of Landor. And as we record today on the evening of November 3rd, uh, spoiler alert, we don't know who won just yet, but Valerie and Phyllis are literally branding America's future. Together, they are leading a partnership with America 250 Foundation to execute a multi-year campaign that builds Americans' awareness and understanding of the nation's 250th anniversary in 2026. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Valerie Aurelio. Okay, kids, all the way from Chicago, I've got Valerie and Phyllis. Valerie and Phyllis, welcome to Obsessed Show. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, it's great to have you both here. And um, this is a rare three-person interview for Obsessed Show. So it's really cool to be able to pull this off via Zoom. You're both in the Chicago area. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, at the time of recording, it's election day, 2020 in the United States. How are you both doing? <laughs> I think I'm going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, as soon as we're done recording, I'm off to vote. I might be leaving it to the last minute, but I will be doing my civic duty tonight. <laughs> we, we'll even let you out of the interview early if you need to. <laughs> you, go, you go do what you got to do. Um, well, how is how is Chicago right now overall? I've I have not been up to Chicago since quarantine, lockdown, and all these fun things started. What what's the general vibe right now in the city? Um, that's an interesting question. Who, who, I just know the general vibe in my dining room at this point. You know? <laughs> I think people here are, um, are still being very, very cautious. Um, it's obviously a very large city, including the suburbs. It's, you know, 6 million people. So, um, I, I think the vibe's optimistic. We're all ready to get back out there in the impending cold of winter and freeze our buns off and put our puffer coats on. <laughs> <laughs> Those are traditional Chicago uh, activities. Past yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. Drink a little. <laughs> That's right. Um, so is is that true for Landor on the whole? I know that you're not, you know, Landor's not just in Chicago. You've got multiple offices and probably people around the world. Are are most folks still remote at this point? They are. It's it's been a crazy 2020. Um, and in some ways, such an interesting journey on not being an essential worker. So <laughs> in some days, some days I just think it's such an incredible industry that we've been able to continue to be creative and collaborative with each other as we transitioned completely to remote. And in, in some ways, you know, I'm very blessed and very thankful for the people that have been essential workers. And I feel, um, you know, blessed that I can do my job from my dining room or my den or my bedroom, wherever I have to hide from the rest of the people that live in my house. Um, but at Landor and Fitch, the catalyst of what 2020 has brought for us creatively has been really interesting. In fact, it's forced us, I think, in a lot of ways to bring tech further into our offering and also just into the way we work with each other. So some people were on the forefront of that and Teams and Zoom and, and being able to work remotely. But what COVID has done for us has really forced us to do it. And so it's as a large firm, I think it's even better connected us at this point. So now we feel like we don't have boundaries. We're building teams with people all over the world, actually, as well as just all over the states. Um, and so in some ways, it's been a catalyst for us creatively. Yeah, it's like necessity is the mother of invention. It just proves itself over and over again. Um, and I think we've pivoted nicely and 
um, yeah, it's, it's exciting and it's different. Different is good for the creative mind, right? Like we like to be jarred, you know, we're not always sure we're comfortable with it, but that discomfort, um, is actually sometimes what creatives thrive on. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, Phyllis, maybe we can start with you with this question. Um, I definitely want to dig more into Landor cause I'm a branding geek at heart and I want to hear more about how you guys do things. Um, but Phyllis, maybe give us your origin story and how you found yourself here at Landor. Oh my goodness. Um, I found myself at Landor, um, after applying through, believe it or not, their website, landor.com like when you used to actually <laughs> apply for a job through a company website um i did that um and they called me back because um the person that i ended up reporting to my former boss um he knew another phyllis murphy from boston massachusetts and he just was so intrigued by this that he couldn't help but call me in for an interview um so it was absolute dumb luck in some ways and then um i had been in entertainment before that so my portfolio was bonkers it was like a picture of krs1 and like a statistic on how many audience members i got into a comedy show it was like just just bonkers, but um, just interesting <laughs> enough to, I guess, um, inspire them to think I might have a shot at this whole branding thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Um, <clears throat> that reminds me of Michael Beirut's story about how he got hired by Massimo Vignelli because Massimo assumed he must be Italian because of all of his, his background and his name because he was from Parma. Ohio, you know, <laughs> just mis <laughs> probably misread his resume. <laughs> like, it's kind of hilarious. Um, Valerie, what's your, what's your background? How'd you find yourself here? Uh, I had a, it's like I married my high school sweetheart or my college sweetheart with Landor. Uh, I, <laughs> I first started land at Landor when I was probably 19 and I interned in their Tokyo office in Japan. So long story about how, how I managed to do that, but showed up at their front door and said, hi, uh, I'd really like to know what you do. Can I, can I work with you for a few months? You don't have to pay me. I just want to be part of it. And they said yes. And they let me come in and I worked there for three months, went back to school for a couple months and came back and did another three months. And during that time, it was very, you know, sort of corporate identity focused in the at Tokyo office at the time. I didn't speak Japanese. So I learned all of my Adobe programs, you know, on the job uh, by sight because I couldn't speak Japanese and all the programs were in Japanese, which I hadn't anticipated and I should have <laughs> before <laughs> I got the job. So it was amazing. Um, but I really fell in love with branding at that point. And then uh, a couple years later, I was visiting the Tokyo office again on a vacation. And they told me that the Cincinnati uh, area was opening a Landor office to service the P&G business. And I was ready to graduate from the graphic design program out of the University of Cincinnati at that time and ended up getting hired full time by Landor in Cincinnati and then rode an incredible um, part of my career really doing global brands with P&G and just traveling the world, to be honest, with that business. Um, and then when it was just about time for something new for me, the Chicago opportunity opened up for me and I was able to come and partner with Phyllis for the last few years to really build something special in Chicago. I mean, we've done a lot of work around how we work faster, leaner, more collaboratively um, in these past few years, which we really see as a new Landor and Fitch approach. And that's been an incredible experience. So I've had a very long career with Landor, know it inside and out. So if you want to ask any, any geeky questions about it, um, I'm your woman, but it's just been an incredibly rewarding and never boring um, career with Landor. That's awesome. My, my closest... Uh, or my expectation of the closest Landor office was the Cincinnati office. So understanding the P&G presence there and kind of the consumer package goods work that you guys were yeah. doing from that office 
that's kind of like my main experience of seeing work from Landor. Um, I'm curious how the focus is maybe similar or different in the Chicago office or what the draw was to, I mean, I can imagine why someone would open a Chicago office, but <laughs> what did you guys see there and what was kind of the target? Well, I, I think originally we were, um, Chicago was open to service Kraft Heinz and business there. Um, obviously them being native Chicagoans as well, or Highland Park or Northbrook or whatever you want to call it, but they were in the area and we've always been very devoted to our clients and wanting to make sure that we're there for them and close with them. And so it was a business decision um, that just kind of blossomed into its own beast, right, Val? <laughs> um, it's a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful thing. Obviously, we service far more than just one client these days. Um, we've grown enormously. Um, but that's that's the origin of the Chicago office. Yeah. Chicago is a cool market because there are it's actually the intersection of so many different industries, which I think makes Chicago kind of a unique place to be. So tons of CPG, really great food and beverage work um, across the board, spirits, beer, all sorts of things, but also financial health um, tech is kind of booming in Chicago as well. Uh, we just moved into our new building, which is across the street from Google, et cetera. So there's just there's a lot happening in Chicago. And we like the idea that we're a hybrid office. We're not just one thing. So we have deep expertise in CBG in CPG, but also do a lot of B2B and other work and corporate work as well. Very cool. Well, again, yeah. we talked about this a little bit at the top of the show, but um, I'd love to dig into the story of and Fitch, because so many of us, I'm sure listening, know the Landor name. The Ann Fitch part is new. Um, tell us what's happening there. Sure. Like I said, never a boring day at Landor. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have actually brought together Landor from a brand consultancy and design perspective with Fitch, who has retail and digital um, chops like no other. And when you put us together, we are actually now the largest brand um, design and experience firm in the world, which is exciting. Our CEO, Jane, likes to say that. But what we love about it is it's like a whole new load of talent that we get to play with, uh, with all, you know, in retail experience, digital all of those things coming in and just adding new life and energy to the way that we're working. So we are excited. And then sandwiched in the middle of that is that beautiful firm, Man vs. Machine, who do world-class motion graphics as well. So as a group, we end up being a really exciting end-to-end -end solution. I think it's cool too that we both have such great founder stories as companies like Rodney Fitch and Walter Landor, who doesn't want to sit on a boat and have some drinks with those two guys <laughs> um, who obviously were just incredibly innovative people who created the industries that we now take for granted. Um, so I do think it's an interesting intersection that we both have very important founder stories at the root of what we do creatively and strategically. Well, maybe in addition to size, um, how else does Landor and Fitch differentiate themselves from some of the other large players in the branding space? I think now we feel like what's so, I would say, relevant and hitting home with potential clients that we're pitching, uh, people that we're talking to that they're like, wow, this is, this is differentiating you guys. Um, it's that we can go from the very beginning of the brand strategy so we can build a brand with you from scratch or reinvent or reinvigorate a, a classic brand that needs it. But we can build that brand strategy. We can do the um, insights and analytics work through our land or processes we can build those brand fundamental assets. And then that starts to get into this beautiful space where those, those brand elements start to come to life through this um, PhD, we call it. So physical, human, and digital spaces, which we're really excited about. That's something that Fitch has brought to, to Landor's thinking. And as it starts to um, accumulate in there and get really exciting, then you have really beautiful brand experiences coming out of that that can manifest themselves across you know, every channel, every media. So the idea that we can take that brand strategy and get even closer to the consumer 
all the way to through Fitch's expertise is what we're saying, that end to end piece of it, and that you've got cohesive creative teams working across that. That's where it gets exciting because you end up with that like really beautiful one vision, but across all of the brand touch points that you need it to be in experiences. Well, and all that wild cross pollination of creative yeah. minds, right? Like just from someone who builds something with their hands to someone who is 3D motion graphics to someone who's verbal identity and naming. Like there's so many disciplines now that we cover that it's extremely exciting to be around each other. And I think it creates better work when you just have points of view from different experiences. So I think that's a richness that really no other company can offer both to clients, but also to new hires and people looking to get into branding. Well, speaking of hires, since you mentioned that, um, are you guys currently hiring and understandable if you're not, but what, what do you look for at Landor and Fitch? What's, what's something that, what kind of talent are you, um, focused on? Well, we are coming out of a hiring freeze. You know, 2020 was brutal for everybody, (laughs) Um, but we're thawing from that a bit. And we are looking for creatives in that designer, senior designer space. And one thing that I think Phyllis and I both get excited about and look for is that big idea, big thinker. So we're really looking for creatives that can be conceptual as well as bringing their sort of executional discipline to the table. We're looking for people who want to collaborate and get messy with other disciplines. So we want our writers to work with our strategists to work side by side with our designers in that really beautiful, we call it that messy gray space that we love to be in. So we're looking for people who want to do that, who want to come in every day, participate, put it all on the table, um, and then also just love their discipline and be able to go away and execute against it beautifully. I love that messy gray space (laughs) concept. (laughs) It's very well put. Um, It is messy indeed, but um, that's awesome. Um, Something else that we talked about that I feel like I kind of botched before we hit record was it's awesome to see two women in positions of leadership at such a big and storied firm like Landor and Fitch. Um, Is is there a lot of female leadership within the firm or is this something that's that's new for you two? There's a good amount at Landor and Fitch, actually. Um, It's pretty inspiring. Um, I think that certainly we've seen that increase over the past few years, but, um, and, and that's just also fantastic, but it's not foreign at Landor in any way, shape or form. I think that Landor and Fitch um, is definitely devoted to ushering in the sort of new age of talent. And that can come from anyone, any color, any shape, any size, any perspective. Um, So it's a great place to be as a female um, and a female creative because that support is there. Um, Phyllis, Sorry, Valerie, if you want to add to that, go ahead. I'm just going to add that the credibility of we are on our third female CEO at Landor specifically. So having grown up at Landor, that type of um, leadership and mentorship and example has been there. And I've always actually known that because of I have sisters and in other industries, et cetera, that have not experienced that. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's there. I think we have work to do in the creative space. We So Phyllis and I are, have both been and are creative leaders in that space. I think there's more work to be done there across the globe um, and more work to be done in other DNI spaces. But very proud to be part of a company that has had that leadership um, and that female leadership for as long as we have. It feels very authentic to my experience, um, which I love. Yep. Cool. Well, Phyllis, where I was starting to go was, um, I don't think we really dug into specifically what the two of you do. So maybe Uh, Phyllis, you could tell us first kind of about your role. Um, I'm a provoker and occasional (laughs) pain in the ass. I will second that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I am a verbal identity expert, so I'm a namer. I name things, um, but, and I'm a writer and, but back to what Val said about sort of thinkers and conceptualizers, um, I think that's where I excel. And I wasn't really joking, a provoker and occasional pain in the ass. What I do is I, is I push that out through writing. Um, but 
you know, it's a little bit bigger than that. That just happens to be my discipline. Um, <laughs> and, you know, as executive creative director, I think that that brings an interesting point of view to the work um, to have somebody whose history and discipline is verbal in a world that is so dominated by visual, but that's also made Val and I like really close partners because we sort of need each other for that cross collaboration. We're like two pieces of a whole. You know, a lot of my career was working with creative directors who came from the writing background as well. So I, I approve of this message. <laughs> I, I think like Leo Burnett and David Ogilvie approve as well. So we're, we're a good company. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're not going on a limb there by saying that, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Valerie, tell us a little bit about your role. Sure. To, to Phyllis's point, she's my words to my pictures or her pictures. So I, I bring the pictures to the table. I'm a graphic designer by trade. Um, and that has been my career. So I have just just fell in love with graphic design as the intersection actually of communication and visuals. Um, and I'm, I am a designer. I'm a problem solver. Um, not a fine artist. I love art always did, but I'm not a fine artist. I am driven by a problem to be solved. I'm driven by deadlines. I love it. Love it. Um, so I, my whole career has really been um, graphic design, a lot of packaging work, a lot of um, large global brand identity systems. And really, like I said, traveling the world, what I was doing when I was doing that was building global brands with global teams and then helping them launch regionally and locally as well. So learning that skill was a big part of my career as well. Um, and then... Yeah, I mean, working with somebody like Phyllis, it's that creative just tension and in a good way, in the best way, and that excitement and getting to work in an industry where you can judge your work by whether you have chills or not. Like that, that's what gets me going. I love the ideas. I love it when my team is pushing me and bringing ideas um, and then expressing them beautifully to people because otherwise it's nothing if, you know, the end user or the end experiencer doesn't feel it too. Um, so that's what I do in, in my spare time. I'm the GM of Landor <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> which I'm actually have nothing very else to do. proud of Landor because they do uh, promote their creative leaders into also studio leadership positions and regional leadership or practice lead positions. And I think that's a commitment and a very outward expression of how much we value creativity and that my team then believes in that as well when they have a, a creative leader leading their studio and leading their businesses um, because that drives a culture that's around the work. Um, and, and Phyllis and I both believe that you build culture in a studio through the creativity and the work. Well, you know, I love to dig into the work and the projects and the case studies and that kind of stuff. And we've got a really cool one in this America 250 project. But but before we get too close to it, um, I'm a bicentennial baby. So this America 250 thing is uh, unfortunately pointing out a big birthday that I have coming up in six years. So if we could just not mention that anymore in the interview, that would be great. Um <laughs> but I, I do want to hear about, um, I mean, of all the places you get to do branding for, you get to do branding for America. That's, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Tell us a little bit about how this project came to be and kind of your role and, and what's happening with it. Sure. Well, Josh, you are the first person officially to be a bicentennial baby that we have talked about. So that's exciting. <laughs> um, we do refer to this project in our studio as the brief of a lifetime. Um, it came to us, I think it kind of trickled in through WPP and then through, you know, through the leadership at Landor. I think it was a long time coming, but where it trickled into us and to our studio was a July 4th vacation <laughs> about a year and a half ago. Um, and I got a phone call that said, "You, we need to be in D.C. with an identity for America's 250th birthday. <laughs> in two weeks. Can you do it? No question. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just always remember it because it was July 4th at the time. Um, and so our Chicago team and Phyllis and I, um, we, we dug in and at, at the time, you know, it was a pro bono project. So we were really leaning in and excited that this was an opportunity to actually serve our country through uh, our talents and what we do, which sometimes doesn't come that often at the scale. Mm -hmm. 
so we dove into the project and we um, ignited our studios across the state. So San Francisco, New York, ourselves and Cincinnati. And we did a, like a crazy two weeks to get ourselves ready to go present um, a round of identity work in Washington to like the com- the commission, the semi-quincentennial commission, which I've practiced a lot to be able to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Just rolls off uh, the tongue. And, really does. Yeah, the semi-quincentennial. Phyllis will tell you a little bit about what we did about that. And it's only 42 <laughs> letters and 75 <laughs> syllables long. So it's a easy breezy. <laughs> Um, and that's how we got into it. And I think the the way that we leaned into the idea that this was the opportunity of a lifetime, it was something that really rose above um, politics or parties or anything like that and really became about creating something with a, a measure of will our country feel feel more united six years from now than they do today. And I think our studio took that really seriously and it became a very mission based project. Um, for us. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's super cool. So I would, I would assume this went beyond the, the pro bono, we need a logo in two weeks kind of thing. (laughs) So how, how has it evolved since that fateful July 4th phone call? Um, Well, we've stayed, I mean, we, we leaned in for quite a while with America 250 and we're, we were pleased to do it and we were excited to do it. And we built I think what we're happy to say is more than just a logo. So that's what they said they needed. Um, When we took a look at the brief and took a look at the opportunity to reach, you know, 330 million people, that's why, you know, one of the reasons why we call it the brief of a lifetime. It's not often that you get to do something with that reach, but the responsibility of being able to do it for all Americans in a very uniting sense, but also to inspire each American in a very individual sense. And that was something that the commission and the America 250 Foundation is very dedicated to. It's part of their purpose statement and they really believe in it. Um, And so all Americans and every American really became a huge challenge for us. And so instead of just, and and not just, we can talk about the logo all day long because I'm really, um, there's a lot of story built into that. But not only did we create a logo, we created a framework and we created um, a brand identity that was a storytelling platform as well. Something that would invite the entire country into it. Something that was, you know, captures the American spirit um, and is able to tell that story from a million different perspectives on any given day. So that's where we went beyond a logo and really into a full brand expression for America 250. Yeah. I mean, a logo is quite a functional request, right? So, mm-hmm. right. Uh, America, 250 years old. There it is. Just we need America and 250 on it. But that's not really the idea, right? <laughs> America is not defined by its age. It's defined by the American spirit, by diversity, by being in a constant state of um, an evolution of identity. So really starting with that idea is so important because you can say, hey, I need a widget for my widget company, or um, you can dig in. And I think that was... um, that was pretty profound because you have to start digging into, okay, well, you know, what does it mean to be America? What does it mean to, what does the American spirit mean? What are the qualities that define it when we're all supposed to be so different from each other? And I think that started to lead to really interesting creative spaces. And again, that storytelling platform that allows people to see themselves as individuals um, in the greater whole, right? The old, you know, E pluribus unum kind of from from <laughs> from many one, but like there there's a little bit of that baked into the idea as well. Was there anything that really stood out to you within this project um, that was especially unexpected, or um, you know, a, a, a tricky part of the request, like it's got to fit on a dime or <laughs> like <laughs> in, anything weird like that? <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question because you kind of hit it on the nail when you said it fit on a dime. Um, I think the breadth of what this identity needed to do was a stunning challenge for us. It really made us stop and think. And one of the ones that sticks in my mind is when we challenged ourselves to 
Can it respectfully fly over a war memorial where we're really honoring those who have given their life for this country and this democracy? And can it be on your cheek as a face paint at, at you know, the 2026 picnic that we'll all be at? And so that celebratory all the way to commemorative scale that this needed to work on um, and be true to was really a huge challenge for us. Especially in a world that's changed so much and how people consume brand, um, you know, versus yeah. the, the bicentennial, like that really kind of could be a widget on a widget on a widget, right? Mm-hmm. Like right. things are very different now and just the enormity of that scale. So from that flag to the dime, to the Coke can, but then also to the phone, to the tablet, to the Twitter, to the, you know, like there's so many more places this will be. Um, yeah. it was, it was a large challenge to create something that felt broad mass appealing to 327.5 million people, not that I'm counting and, (laughs) um, special, not generic. (laughs) And we've, we've got another six years for new things. The next, you know, TikTok or whatever is going to show up next year and the year after and the year after we, and it's less like, we don't know if something will, but it's, we know (laughs) something else wacky that's, that we haven't haven't even seen yet is going to happen between now and then. Maybe right. We, we don't know what it is, but we're pretty sure it's coming. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is exciting, too. So, again, that the scale of flex was mind boggling. I was also surprised at how petrified I was during our first presentation to the commission. <laughs> like you think you get to a certain point in your career and the jitters quell a little bit. They're not quite as crazy as they were. Like I just thought I was going to pass out before we stood up in front of that commission in Washington, DC and presented <laughs> the identity for America, you know, to all, the, to, to all of Washington, DC. I thought I was going to die, but it was exhilarating, but it was also very interesting to reconnect to that side of you. That's like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't. Um, so I'm, I'm just picturing there. the Statue of Liberty at the boardroom, like <laughs> sitting at the table, you know, a little she bit scowly. Was <laughs> she was there in spirit for sure. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, in well, a fun way, been, but. I was going to say the presentation was at the historic Decatur house, which from the corner of the window, you can see like the white house <laughs> from there. So it's definitely a moment for us of, of, um, gravity. <laughs> Yeah. It was. And it was like, so we were just so energized um, and we were standing in sort of the middle of a U shape of tables, kind of cha-chaing back and forth to try to like talk to everyone. Um, and the great news is only one person fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> we were the post-lunch. <laughs> oh, yeah, we were the post-lunch performance, but it, that was, it was a super cool <laughs> moment, to be honest with you. Well, and in some ways it felt like a responsibility because when you think about owning who you are and the perspective you bring, um, we're not historians, we're not politicians, um, we're not academics, directors of the Smithsonian, all of the, all of which were in the audience that we were presenting to. And I actually felt a real responsibility to the American people to bring them something that they were going to like and that they were going to be able to embrace and participate in and be part of and really get excited about. And if I, if I shouldn't say if I wasn't going to wear it, if actually um, my team wouldn't wear it on a t-shirt, then we shouldn't bring it, you know, um, to the commission. And so I think we, we had a responsibility to bring that more for the people built by the people um, perspective to it, to help, the America 250 Foundation bring something to the nation that they would want to adopt and really live and breathe for the next six years. You never show the nation the solution you don't want it to pick. <laughs> <laughs> Words to live by. But right. all, all right. of the identity by. designers listening right now, yep. or if you're on YouTube, <laughs> um, <laughs> will want to know the answer to this question. Did Did you take a solution to present, or did you bring options? And how does and how does that differ maybe from how Landor and Fitch would normally present? It's a great question. We took we took a round of solutions, a set of solutions and options to the commission, um, the executive part of the commission. 
Um, and that was the first meeting or two. We got feedback from them. So we presented six identity options. We got feedback and then went back with three refined routes. Um, and then the commission of that particular piece of the commission made an executive decision and said, we're bringing one identity to the full commission. Um, and so it was a bold move, but I think it was a smart one. Don't quote me on this, but democracy is a beautiful thing, but not necessarily in design. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea that you know we would have built that by commission is not a good one. So they were really smart and they took one well thought out um, brand identity with the journey presented um, with it to the commission. And then it was a go or no go situation. <laughs> You know, that'd be an interesting tweak to the Electoral College that the Electoral College <laughs> brings forth the candidate and then the nation gets another go or no go. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a go in that meeting, which was exciting. And then that from there, um, the identity was included in the report to the president, um, to the White House that went at the end of the year. And that got a green light as well. And so we have a green light so far um, with this identity and this brand experience that we're creating, um, along with all the other beautiful things that the commission is doing um, in anticipation of the birthday. So we're excited about it. But Josh, you brought up an interesting point about the six-year ramp up. I think that's been another interesting challenge for us. We're you know, as you know, we're in an industry that thinks in days, minutes, hours, weeks, like that's where we're operating. And this is a six year journey. And so we're excited to think about the strategy of how we build awareness in the country for it. So that by the time we get to the semi Quinn, you know, we'll have everybody ready to be and, and fully participating in it. Awesome. Well, um, yeah. Valerie, we've got to get you out of here to go vote here real soon. So we're going to wrap this up in a couple of questions. But um, okay. so I'm curious if either of you have any design heroes or agency heroes that you looked up to um, kind of coming up in the biz or um, or somebody you look up to now. <laughs> I look up to Val. Aww. I'm not from the biz. Like this was like my life at Landor has been my life in the biz. I didn't think I was going to be an ECD of an agency. I didn't think I was going to be a namer because like nobody thinks they're going to be a namer. Let's just set that straight. Um, so I didn't, I didn't know, like, I really thought I was going to be writing TV shows or something. I, I just didn't know a novelist, a playwright. So um, I didn't grow up in love with any sort of, I grew up in love with design and, and world building. Um, but everything I know about branding, I learned at Landor. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, um, Val's probably the closest thing to a design hero that I would ever have. Very cool. That's very nice of you, Phyllis. <laughs> we'll end it on that. <laughs> you guys, Cause I can return the compliment for sure. Um, I think, I think the heroes to me, and I'm not, I'm not going to name anyone specific, although I have plenty of design heroes um, and plenty of people that I wish I was. Yeah, um, well, that's a different question, right? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I just, I respect the people who want to work alongside the people that make them better every day. It's easy to be the smartest person in the room. It's really hard to feel like you're not the smartest person in the room. And so one of the reasons that people oftentimes come back to Landor, having left to experience new things, and they come back and they say, I've just never worked with more talented people. And I think it takes guts to do that every day. And I think it, it takes guts to walk in the door thinking or turning on the Zoom now thinking, um, how am I going to live up to this team today? And so I, you know, my hero is really our team and the creatives that come in every day and put it on the table. Valerie, do you have any favorite piece of advice that you've received or maybe a favorite piece of advice to pass along to your team members? I have a piece of advice that has took me a long time to learn for myself. Uh, you are the creative that you are. You don't need to fit into a mold. You don't need to fit into skinny jeans or big black, back, you know, big black glasses. Um, 
those people are who they are and you are who you are. And so bring what you bring every day and be true to that. And don't spend one second of your career worrying that you don't fit into the mold of what a creative director looks like or sounds like or comes from. Um, and that's been a hard earned lesson for me. And, and I think once I learned it is really when I was able to truly be myself with the creatives that I was leading, which then unlocks them even further. That's awesome. Uh, Phyllis, anything that you'd like to share in the advice category? I think it was just this question that was posed to me um, fairly recently by our former CCO, Peter Knapp, which is sort of like, what is it you do? But this idea of figure out what you do um, and own it. So the evoker, the provoker, the pain in the ass, like you can do it through photography, 3D motion. You can be a writer, like figure out what you are. Um, and don't chain it to your discipline. Just understand that's how you express it. But there is something inside you that is pure. Um, and it's it's a journey to get to figuring out what those two or three things you really are, are. Um, but it's an exciting one. Comes with a lot of failure, shame, embarrassment, delight, surprise, <laughs> exhilaration, uh, sadness, laughter, music, <laughs> dancing, and gin. All of those things, but um, it's, it's an amazing journey as a creative when you understand what you do in a deeper sense. I love that. Um, I know we are almost out of time here, but I can't let the two of you go without asking you each what you find you are most obsessed with right now. And this can be life, can be within your four walls, can be business, can be design, writing, whatever. What? What do you find you're most obsessed with right now? Um, on one level, I am obsessed with Disney emoji blitz, which has ruined my life. So we'll just put that out, out on the table. Um, it's ruined my life um, in the best of ways. Um, but besides that, I, I will answer that from a creative perspective. I am obsessed with the experimentation that's happening in creativity, not about what the end game is, but what the actual process is. So I think there's a lot of experimentation going on in who are the creatives that are making up these teams? Are they artificial intelligence? Are we inviting that to the table in creativity? And can that be part of the conversation? Um, I think the experimentation that we've embarked upon with America 250 around what happens if we don't just build a logo? What happens if we take a story and we put it into the hands of the American people and let them help us build this experience? We don't know what that outcome will be, and I'm sure there will be highs and lows to it, but the thrill of experimenting inside the process is what I'm finding really rewarding. And there's just a little bit less emphasis on what that artifact is at the end of it, because I think in this new culture where we're looking to discover and explore, the actual act and process of creating is becoming very important and very experimental. Nice. Yeah. Phyllis, how about you? Alternate forms of language. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just other ways people communicate, um, American sign language, but not limited to ASL. Um, I think Braille is interesting. I think nonverbal communication is interesting. So maybe just from a more language geeky perspective. Um, Are you talking like Esperanto here? Or? <laughs> Esperanto has come up in conversation. <laughs> like I've just been, yeah, I don't think I'll, I think it would actually, I'll, I'll start with Braille and sign language, but, um, um, yeah, like when, when we're not using our mouths or, you know, to create language, to create verbalization, how do we verbalize things? I just, I think it's really interesting. Love it. Love it. But I've been in this dining room for a really long time, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, I'm ready for some classes. That's all I can say. Well, <laughs> hey, before we let the two of you go, let us know where we can find you on the interwebs and learn more about Landor and Fitch. Well, starting in 2021, you will find us <laughs> at landorandfitch.com. <laughs> I don't know yet. how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Landor.com and Fitch.com. Um, but, uh, but you'll find us there. You'll find um, me 
there. I'm not a huge social media person, so you will find me professionally on the interweb. Um, but Phyllis, where will they find you? In my dining room. <laughs> <laughs> We've already covered this. <laughs> Hopefully they'll find me at the polls in about 10 minutes. But um, <laughs> yeah, like LinkedIn, Instagram. I don't think I've got any. I shouldn't even say this. I don't think I've got much set to private. I just can't even like, be, I'm convinced no one cares anyway. So none of it's set to <laughs> private. But um, yeah, I, you know. An abundance of places. And of course, once Chicago comes out of whatever this is, you can find me uh, yeah. walking around, looking at the beautiful architecture and gaining inspiration. Yeah. Check out our Landor Chicago um, Instagram account. It's a lot of fun. It'll show you the culture and the work and all of the shenanigans that happen in our Chicago studio. And check it out and see if it might be something you're interested in. And then... Josh, I just want to ask all your designers that listen and your creatives to keep an eye out for what's happening over the next six years with America 250 and try to find a way to get involved or design for it. Yep. Um, there will be so many organizations and commissions and states and cities that want to be a part of this. And I think designers everywhere could make this a really cool thing um, if we all join in and start to participate and create within what we've started here. So we would love that. And we invite everyone to do it. Yeah, that's awesome. And they can just remember they're also celebrating my birthday. <laughs> that's right. They We're going to celebrate all year long. <laughs> it's a big one. Big one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we reveal what that age is, um, if, for people who are not very good at math, I'm going to have to let you both go. But thank you both for being on the show today. It was a pleasure meeting both of you. I can't wait to hop up to Chicago here when all this is over and meet you in person. Uh, but thanks for being on the show and thank you for being obsessed with design. OK, kids, that's episode number 153 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to ObsessedShow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at ObsessedShow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to ObsessedShow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.